Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a lecturer, a climate corruption reporter and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic and political crises that we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. This week I spoke with Charlie Gardner. Charlie is a conservation scientist, a writer and an environmental activist. He works with Scientists for Rebellion and left uh, actually the university last year in order to focus all of his energies on the climate emergency and writing mainstream science books i.e. trying to get this information to the public in a way that we can understand it. We discuss corruption in politics, money in politics, the absurdity of these heavily subsidised fossil fuel companies propping up our failing economy. We discuss Extinction Rebellion and Scientists for Rebellion, their demands, their messaging, what they can do now to engage a public. And Charlie makes a fantastic comment towards the end of the episode about how the public can also choose to engage themselves more. On that note, we also discuss deliberative democracy, media, community, and how a just transition can paint a better future for everyone. This is a wide ranging conversation that touches on all of the major talking points in the climate emergency, from energy, economy, and politics to ecology and how ecological systems actually find stability. So a lot to learn here and I hope you all enjoy this episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. If you're loving the show, support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. The link is in the description box below. By signing up, you'll also get access to the weekly article I write inspired by each interview. Thank you to everyone who has signed up and is supporting the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who keep the project going every week. Charlie, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks so much, Rachel. It's, it's great to be here. Could you give some background about your uh, career, how you got into sort of, you know, Scientist Rebellion and the climate? Because I know you worked in conservation first. Was that your inroad? Yeah, absolutely. So that's what I've always been interested in ever since I was a very young child. I've just, I, I grew up in countries with lots of endangered species and my, my parents' friends were endangered species conservationists working to save these things from extinction. So that's what I've always wanted oh, wow. to do ever since I, I was really young, really. And I, I, I trained myself up to do that. I um, went and did a zoology degree and I did a master's in conservation. And then I spent a lot of time working in uh, in the global south in tropical low-income countries including madagascar so i lived in madagascar for 10 years and there i was working with rural communities working with with, with farming communities to help them utilize their forest resources more sustainably working with small-scale fishing communities to help establish sustainable uh, fisheries management and um for a long time i I was very happy with, with, with what I was doing. You know, I think there are few things more important than conserving the living world. We can't address climate mm. change without a living world. And of course we can't, um, promote human prosperity without, without a living natural world. Mm. But in 2015, I, I moved back to the UK and I, I got a job working at the university. So I worked at the university of Kent. I was teaching students, undergrads and master's students about conservation, but I was also asked to teach them a, a module about climate change. And mm. I'd always been aware of climate change, of course, you know, since, since the eighties, but I, I think like many people, I had, I sort of refused to, to, to really think about it. I, I hid away from it. I, I, I wouldn't allow myself to consider the full consequences, the full implications of, of what climate change meant. Um, both for, for me as an individual, but also for, for conservation, for my chosen field, because I knew mm. that, um, obviously, you know, climate change changes everything. And that includes how we do conservation. So I was, I was scared of it. I was scared to let it in, uh, mm. but teaching undergraduate students about it, um, forced me obviously to, to read as much as I possibly could. And there were two things, two, two impacts that had on me. One was that I really saw just how impactful this is going to be um 
uh, and is already in fact, and it made it just impossible to turn away from. It made it impossible to just simply focus on on, on trying to conserve biodiversity um, when climate change is the biggest threat to biodiversity. So we really need to adapt to, to this new reality. But the second thing, the second real impact that that had on me um, was more as as an individual rather than just as a scientist, as a citizen. And I found it impossible to to, to, to be going into lecture theatres telling young people about what's happening and what's coming in their future and how bleak our prospects are, and then just walking away doing nothing about it. So yeah. um, I felt this strong need to to, to get involved in in something to do more with, 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 with this knowledge I had, but I didn't really feel like I couldn't see anything that was worth my while getting involved in, you know, I, obviously I was already a member of Greenpeace and, and friends of the earth and these things and had been for a long time, but these organizations had been doing their campaigning for a long time and none of it was working. They were just being ignored. So it, it wasn't obvious that that was worth my energy, you know? So I, I sort mm. of, I did what a lot of people have been doing and that's, sitting at home feeling bad about not doing anything but still not doing anything mm. so then in in, in 2018 I, I i turned on the telly one day and, and there was there was extinction rebellion on a bridge and um, blocking bridges in london and i just felt this this is what i've been waiting for on a number of levels so on the one hand i was super excited because as a conservationist ever since i was young i've always dreamed of this day when ordinary people would be out on the streets fighting for nature. So I just, mm. it made me so happy to see that. But the other thing also is that it opened my eyes to how to achieve change. Because as a scientist, I'd been just sitting there relying on this idea that all we need to achieve change is information. If we if we generate the information, warn our leaders and warn the public about how how mm. you know, dangerous the destruction of nature is, then someone will act on those warnings and our leaders will will yeah make wise decisions and, and they'll do what needs to be done. But obviously that hasn't been happening. You know, it's clear as day. Climate change and the destruction of nature are very clear evidence that our leaders don't ignore, don't, don't listen to scientific warnings. They ignore them. And yet our leaders were responding to these people blocking bridges. They were listening to them. And mm. it, it made me see that actually um, this isn't about information. This isn't about science at all. I mean, it's, it's about, yeah, policymaking is about power and influence. And, and for so long, uh, environmentalists have been ignored in, in, in policymaking because, you know, we go to, to our governments, we go to our leaders with information and we forget that other people, other stakeholders are also trying to persuade mm. our governments to, to do certain things, fossil fuel industries, autom automotive industries, agribusiness industries, aviation industries. They're all also trying to do try to persuade the, the government to do things in their favor. And, you know, while we were going to the government trying to persuade them with, with information and data and graphs, these other stakeholders are going to the government and trying to persuade them with vast piles of money. So obviously they're <laughs> winning and we're not. And yet, so it, it, so, you know, obviously this isn't a game of inflation. This is about power and influence. Um, and and when I saw Extinction Rebellion on, on the streets in 2018, I finally, it finally clicked that this was a way for me to have, to increase my power and influence. If I have zero power as a scientist because my words are just ignored, my challenge is, is, is to make myself unignorable or less easy to ignore and, and take into the streets is, is a way to do that. So I, I originally got involved with Extinction Rebellion just as a citizen, but late in 2019, we formed um, a scientist group called, called Scientists for Extinction Rebellion. And ever since then, I've been participating not so much as a citizen, but as, as explicitly as a scientist, because I have, I feel, um, I feel it's more powerful that way because Partly because society respects scientists. Yeah, scientists are some of the most respected members of society. And with that um, comes, you know, that means people are more likely to listen to scientists than to ordinary members of the street. And I think that gives me um, a, a little bit of extra responsibility to act because, mm -hmm. because 
um, you know, rightly or wrongly, because the, having these two letters, doctor in front of my name, gives me a certain authority. I, I feel I have a, a, an obligation to use that authority, and, and, and I do that through activism. Mm. I, let's get into that uh, relationship between politics and science a little bit more, because obviously the you know governments around the world fund the IPCC report, um, or fund it, ask scientists to work unpaid to produce it every three years. Um, so obviously there is this relationship with science and it seems that they are presenting that they are curious uh, and do want to have the real data. And yet somewhere between knowing that they need to have the real data and then creating policies that reflect that real data, something gets lost. What do you think is happening there? I think it's, I, I think there is still despite the words, despite the fine talk, I think there is still no genuine or very little genuine desire from um, governments, certainly from, from governments in industrial countries, to actually implement and accelerate this energy transition from fossil fuels to, to other ways to, to fuel our economy. Um, that, that they see that Talking the talk is required, and they've done, they've done a very good job of that. But so far, when we look at their actual behavior rather than the words they're speaking, we see very little evidence of, of them you know, putting in place anything that will actually facilitate this transition. So if we look at the UK, for example, the UK mm -hmm. uh, calls itself a global climate leader and has done some, some, you know, some quite good things. So... Uh, we were the first major economy to to set a, a decarbonisation target and enshrine it into law. We we, we set a a twenty fifty target to achieve net zero, and yeah, being the first to do that is really important. That that opened the doors and allowed others to follow. But the, the problem mm. about the twenty fifty target is that it doesn't require action now. A 2050 target is an excuse to kick the can down the road because it's your yeah. distant successors that are going to have to deal with it. You are going to be yeah. long gone. So there's this idea that, that you know, they, they can set the targets now and leave their successors to do it. But of course, these are very difficult, very, um, yeah, they're processes that take a long time. So if we want to reach zero uh, carbon by 2050, we act absolutely need to get the ball rolling now. We need to implement the policies now, but that's not happening. So if you look at the UK, uh, government policies are completely incompatible with the targets they've set. They're saying the fine words, but they're not walking the walk at all. So since the, um, the 2050 target was, was declared, the government has a, um, also announced a 27 billion pound road expansion network they've mm. talked about airports expansions they talk they've opened a new um they've given the green light for a new coal mine in northumbria and the expansion of another coal mine in wales they have opened the door to fracking again which is you know significantly worse than just production of clean of, of normal fossil fuels they're talking mm. about uh, licensing you know, over 100 new licenses in for new oil and gas exploration in the North Sea, even though we know, mm -hmm. even though everybody says no new oil or gas in the United Nations, the International Energy Agency, all say we cannot have any further oil and gas exploration. And yet the, the government's new energy policy is based on further new oil and gas exploration. They are ignoring the expertise. The government's own advisors is saying we should go for onshore wind and yet they're ignoring their own advisors and saying, no, we're going to go for oil and gas instead. It's So it's clear that this is not, uh, yeah, these are not decisions made in ignorance. Governments are deciding to go for oil and gas because they think climate change isn't a problem. It's, yeah, th these, th these outcomes are the results of corruption it's political corruption it's, it's corruption of the democratic process you know it, it's it's the result of of, of political funding of, of donations mm. and lobbying now fossil fuel companies don't you know they they have much much better access to government than 
ordinary citizens or, or other, you know, campaigning groups have in 2019 or was it 2020? Um, the, the, the government's uh, ministry uh, or the Department for Energy met with fracking companies 28 times. They refused to meet with anti-fracking wow. um, campaigners even once. So those that have a vested interest in um, maintaining things as we are, in not changing, mm. because yeah, as, as much as the way things are is destroying the world, it's also making certain people very, very wealthy. So, of course, they don't want mm. it to change. And those people have much, much greater access to government than ordinary citizens do. So, as a result, the, um, you know, the decisions that the government make favor this, this tiny, uh, relatively tiny number of, of, of people that, that benefit from fossil fuels industries. And they go against you know, the 99% of the, the rest of the citizenry. That, that suffer from this. George Monbiot has um, a, a, a very interesting uh, concept, a very interesting term for this. He calls it the polluter paradox. The basic idea is that you know, the dirtier your industry, the more you have to spend on political lobbying to avoid getting mm. regulated out of existence. Therefore, <laughs> governments end up getting um, primarily funded by the very dirtiest industries, and they end up governing f for the benefit of the very dirtiest industries. It, it's shocking, but this is what That's happens amazing. when we allow money to corrupt political processes. We, we, we don't call it corruption. We call it donations and lobbying. But as far as yeah. I'm concerned, it is corruption. Mm. I wonder if there is any sort of awareness in government, and I use that term very lightly given the current government, uh, on the date of recording, Liz Truss is still Prime Minister, everybody. She probably won't be in a few weeks. <laughs> um, I just, I wonder if there's a certain awareness of um, the fact that like just how difficult the transition would be maybe that is keeping the government investing in or subsidizing or um interested in oil and gas as well there seems to be and let's talk about this because you are a scientist and an activist and this is fascinating like there seems to be a slight disconnect perhaps between like the necessary clarity of activist messages about oil and gas versus what a transition would actually look like um, in that it would have to be about contracting our energy uses as well. You know, it would take years and years and years to get a renewable economy online. Uh, we cannot substitute a renewable economy for a fossil fuel economy. Is there perhaps that tension or awareness in, do you think, in government um, that is sort of continuing this madness of still grasping at the easiest option? Because trying to explain to citizens, um, yeah, okay, we'll go green, but life's going to have to change is too complicated a political message. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So it's not, it's not as simple as, as, as I suggested. It's not purely a result of, of um, corruption. It's also the fact that this is the greatest challenge there has ever been. This is mm. the most difficult thing that anyone has ever tried to do. And the yeah, big challenges are scary. They're terrifying. And that's another reason why why 2050 deadline is, is, is so attractive to a politician, because it yeah. means you don't have to do it yourself. And the thing is, nobody knows how, how this is going to work, how to actually do it. Yeah. So, so on a technical level, this isn't such a problem, I, I don't think. You know, we have the technology, particularly things for like, like things um, with regards to electrification and, and, you know, sectors and technologies that are easy to decarbonize. We have the technology there. It's not a technical problem. It's it's a social problem. The question is, is how to um, get these things implemented at the necessary scale. So, and, and, and it's very scary. Politicians know it won't be easy. They know some things might not be popular and, and, and they know that it's just, you know, we don't have all the answers and it's going to be very difficult. So when faced with, with such an enormous challenge, I, th I think there is always a temptation to seek comfort in, in putting it off and pretending you don't have to do it, just procrastinating. Mm. So mm. Rebecca Willis has, has written a wonderful book on this called Too Hot to Handle. It's just a small book. She's interviewed lots of MPs in, um, in, 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 in parliament 
and she talks about this this not knowing how to do it barrier as 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 being a real issue. Yeah. So I, I think that that is an issue. Um, you, you touched on another thing, um, which is political short termism. Yeah. yeah, some of the things that need to be done will not necessarily be popular. We need to curtail high carbon uh, lifestyles, for example. Mm. And politicians are scared of, of, of doing things that might not be popular because they respond to um, you know, short term voting cycles. They, their primary mm. concern is, is, to, um, is to get elected again within four years. So that, that short termism is a real constraint, I think, on difficult decision making. And that's why I'm a big supporter of, um, of participatory democracy, deliberative democracy. Mm. So this is something that, that Extinction Rebellion and, and my group Scientist Rebellion both uh, heavily promote. The idea is that you can, so governments can, can sort of wash their hands almost of really difficult and potentially unpopular decision making by allowing citizens to make those decisions on, on their behalf in a systematic process. So this is called the citizens assembly, um, whereby uh, a representative sample of the population are selected, um, a bit like uh, how they're selected with jury duty, but there's, yeah, you might get a hundred citizens and they represent the population in terms of um, age, division, and socioeconomic mix and that. So then, so it's a representative sample. They deliver, they, they hear from the experts about an issue um, but they hear directly from the experts. They're, yeah, they're not yeah. hearing from the media. They're, 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 they're getting the information straight. And then they deliberate. They discuss what to do amongst themselves. And then they make recommendations to the government. And then the government can, can choose to implement those recommendations. And it's sort of buffered from individual politicians that are, are buffered from any um, you know, negative feedback or unpopularity of the decisions because we didn't make these yeah. decisions. It was a citizen-based decision. And there's a number of reasons why that really works, why, why it's really good. It's not just that um, it allows politicians to make difficult decisions. It also uh, removes politicians from the corrupting influence of, yeah, of special interests. But I think a third thing that we, we often don't hear about but, but which I, I'm a strong believer in, is the more different people from different backgrounds with different views are involved in making a decision, the better the decision will be because it's taken account of lots of different people's needs and views. And I think that's really important. So, so I, um, yeah, I campaign for, for citizens' assemblies. These have been used successfully in the past. So in mm -hmm. Ireland, for example, they use they. They, they, they wanted to, to raise the issue of abortion because there were grassroots campaigns calling for um, decriminalization of abortion, but, but, but the government didn't want to really touch it because it's such a politically hot issue because it gets, mm. you know, because people have had strong feelings about this and they, they didn't want to get involved in the mess. So they, they, they formed a citizens assembly. The, the ultimate recommendation of the Citizens' Assembly was to have a referendum, a nationwide referendum on abortion. The government implemented that, um, that decision. They held a referendum. The people of Ireland voted to legalize abortion, and it was done. Yeah. And you know, this, yeah. it was a seemingly intractable political problem that politicians have, had avoided for such a long time because it was such a difficult problem. But Citizens' Assemblies allowed them to, to overcome that problem in a way that avoided mm. them um, being too directly responsible for, for outcomes that, that some people might not be happy with. I just learned yesterday um, on Twitter that there is currently a citizens' assembly on biodiversity going on in Ireland right now. Um, okay. Citizens, 99 citizens are, are, are meeting, they're listening to biodiversity experts. They will make policy recommendations to the government on how to stop the hemorrhaging of, of the natural world from the mm. Republic of Ireland. It's, it's fantastic news. I'm so mm. excited to hear it. <laughs> Let's hope. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what happens with that and how it works out. I think 
I interviewed uh, Matt Leininger, Leininger not long ago about he's the head of democracy innovation at the National Conference on Citizenship in the United States. And we had a fascinating conversation about all of these things, like all of these amazing tweaks and uh, innovations that you can use in democracy to suddenly make people feel so much more engaged and take more responsibility and be willing as well to learn more uh, if their voices are going to be heard. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what happens with that in Ireland, because especially it's it's not as, as simple as the question of abortion. That really is, you know, taking information in, and data from experts rather than sort of presenting opinions and political sides. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what happens. There's a couple of things I want to stop on. Um, the first, uh, I want to go back to the renewable economy quickly. Um, I have interviewed Simon Michon on this, and he says that um, we have there are technical problems with the renewable economy because we don't have enough materials and minerals for a renewable economy. Um, so that we, if we want the whole world to be renewable, we will have to go from a 19 terawatt to a 5 terawatt society. Uh, Jason Hickel of Degrowth as well, he's not coming at it from the energy perspective, but he says, you know, we're fundamentally going to have to contract the economy because you just cannot have an ever, you know, an infinitely growing um, economy on a finite planet. Um, and to pull that all together, Susan Krumdijk, uh, who sort of is created transition engineering, has said everybody needs to stop worrying so much. Like if you create the right kind of technology, all of these political and social changes will happen as a byproduct of that technology, essentially. Um, like if you can, if you can engineer the world in a certain way, you're engineering the future. Um, is certainly I don't necessarily see in XR like the messaging about degrowth or about contraction or about um, how a renew what a renewable world would actually look like because it could be loads better, right? Why why do we need to use as much energy as we do? Um, is there a reason for that? Is that just because of the messaging is quite complicated and easily hijacked? So. Scientist Rebellion, which is a sister movement to Extinction Rebellion, we explicitly mm. endorse degrowth um, right. for, 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 for the reasons you say. With Extinction Rebellion, there was a, a, a decision made uh, very early on, I think, in the founding of, of the organization that we would not specifically endorse particular policies. Instead, right. we simply endorse citizens' assemblies um, to okay. allow um, participatory decision-making um, in, in support of, of, of certain strategies. So I, th I think that is, um, it, it, it's primarily that. It, it's, you know, XR has taken the position that we will not be prescriptive. We are, we are the alarm. We're not going to tell society what to do. And I think there are, are, are good reasons for that. I think, you know, um, quite, quite often Twitter trolls accuse um, activists of, of, of being authoritarian. Well, you know, it's absolutely, mm -hmm. that, that's the very last thing we are. We're not, we're not saying what needs to be done at all. We're, 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 we're mm -hmm. just, we're, we're setting, um, we're talking about outcomes that are needed, but not how to get there. And we're saying it, it's society that has to decide how to get there. I, I do see mm. your point. I think there there is a um, a risk of of negative messaging associated with, with, with degrowth, or there's a risk of, of that being spun in such a way as that it appears negative. Yeah. You know, Liz, Liz Truss has 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 said that you know the 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 number one priority for for the UK as a nation is growth, growth, growth. And she's labelled um, her opponents as an anti-growth coalition. So, you know, the official line of, 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 of the UK government and its media supporters is that growth is the most important thing there is. And this has been, I mean, essentially, if, if, if the world has been governed and managed according to one rule over the last 40 years, that's the rule. Growth is the most important mm. thing there is. So, so to come along and say, actually, um, not everything needs to grow. Many sectors need to contract because these sectors are actually ne negative 
for for, for, for people, for the world, whatever, um, mm. is 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 a really radical thing to say. Uh, to go even further than that and say it's not just some sectors need to contract, but there needs to be an overall contraction. This is. Mm. Um, It's a very, very important conversation to have, but it's a difficult one to have because um, proponents of growth can, uh, you know, it, it immediately just, just, just dismiss people saying this because, because, because growth, the idea of growth is, is an unshakable, it's an unchallengeable value, mm. but it's a value that mm. must be challenged because, as we all know, it, it, it's clear, you, you know. Even young children can intuitively see that we cannot keep growing forever on a, on on yeah. a finite planet, and really, it's it's quite extraordinary that otherwise intelligent people have been persuaded to think that this is somehow yeah possible or, or viable. You, you know, these people are utterly divorced from from reality, but it's it's such an ingrained. Uh, idea that that it's it, it's it's a difficult one to challenge. I think it is hugely important to challenge, and I'm so yeah. excited to see the the blossoming of the degrowth mo movement over these last few years. And and you know, obviously, it is essential. Obviously, we're not going to avoid um, the the worst of everything, and we're not going to avoid collapse in, until we start. Um, contracting our economy because of course it's not just about carbon either you, you know it, it's about material consumption um, yeah. which is is every bit as much of a, 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 a an urgent concern as as, as climate change is so um, sorry I've, I've gone off on one and 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 no, no, wait no, your original fun. question but yeah it, it was a deliberate decision on, on XR's part as much as you you will find that 99 percent of, of extinction rebellion members, are supporters of degrowth. We just don't have that as an official policy because we our, our position is, is not to be prescriptive. Right. Okay. Is there anything that we can learn from conservation about how to deal with growth? Because I was having this conversation just the other night um, about empires and nations and about the idea of, you know, how do you reach a political stasis? How do you reach a point where you have a, a range and a people, a nation, an economy is just comfortable within that range. And we were thinking about, you know, biology and, and lots of different sort of spheres of thought and just God, stasis is it's quite a difficult thing to actually grasp. That is not necessarily how life works on this planet. It's, you know, growth and decay, growth and decay. So is there anything that we can learn from like the principles of conservation about how to implement um, stability, say, politically or e even materially? <sighs> This is a very, very interesting question, and I, I'd love to spend a bit more time reflecting on it and to come back to you on that. I've never actually thought about this. I think, I, I'm not sure about conservation itself, but ecology and understanding of how the natural world mm. functions, I think, does, um, does give us some insights into this. Because, yeah, of course, ecosystems aren't in stasis. They are... Um, it's better to think of them as a, a dynamic equilibrium rather than mm. stasis. So they, you know, they're, 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 const they're dynamic, they're constantly changing, but they, um, yeah, a, a mature balanced ecosystem will, will revert back to, um, towards an equilibrium because, um, it's made up of so many different parts that, mm. um, that it leads to sort of, of, of homeostasis. No, no one species can come to dominate because if it grows too abundant, its predators and parasites will grow very abundant too, or it'll run out mm. of food sources and they will bring its population back down. So I think one lesson of that is that, you know, sort of, Nature naturally, ecosystems naturally have lots and lots and lots of stakeholders. Those stakeholders are, are mm. you know, c competing and cooperating in, in different ways. As a result, we get, we get stasis because no one stakeholder, no one interest um, takes precedence. With our societies, with our governance, we have governance systems 
which favor certain interests, capitalists, growth, mm. fossil fuel industries. So this is like an ecosystem that was where the constraints on one particular species have been lifted. Um, right, yeah. you, you know, like, like if you have a species mm. that, that didn't have predators or parasites anymore. Um, and so everything favors that species and then it comes to dominate and that's, um, and, and we, and then that's to, um, to the detriment of every other species in that landscape. And we see this with the, the problem of invasive species. So sometimes mm. a species that is, um, adapted to, 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 that has evolved in one area is taken to a new place. And, but in that new place, it doesn't have predators. The, the parasites aren't, aren't adapted to it. They don't know how to, how to eat it or whatever. So they, their populations explode and they create real, real problems because they're, the, the balance between that species and other species has been destroyed. So it's, a, it's I think it's a bit like that in, 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 our, in our governance systems rather than our government's um, providing balanced and, and, and fair support for different interests and different sectors, they, their support is overwhelmingly going for um, certain sectors like fossil fuels because of the polluter paradox yeah. that we talked about. And as a result, yeah. the sort of the ecosystem of people and interests is out of balance because certain are favored and certain are, 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 are not. So, um, so I think that's, I, I don't know. I, I think that analogy works quite well for 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 mm. um, ecosystems and uh, economic systems. I, I don't know about conservation because you know the, the conservation response to a situation where an ecosystem has been knocked out of balance is um, is to control the species that are are dominating and and impacting everything else. So I, I, I suppose the, the the logical extension of my analogy is shut down fossil fuel industries. <laughs> yeah, that, that, they're the invasive species here that are um, mm. destroying everything else for their own benefit because because there's no balance, there's no governance to keep them in control. So so yeah, the answer mm. is is rein them in use, using using governance. But for that, we need to get their influence out of government. We need to stop fossil fuel interests paying governments, um, funding governments, um, to, to, to give governments the freedom to actually say, no, we, 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 we can't let you operate in this way anymore. There seems to be also a necessity for different movements to join up because Obviously, one of the main concerns um, that people have who work in these kinds of industries is that they would lose their job and therefore that the environmental movement isn't on their side and that the environmental movement doesn't care about working class people. Now, when we live in a um, societal ecosystem that has propaganda media as well that fuel those messages, it's incredibly unhelpful. And no matter what, that is something that I think for any sort of for us to see success, we're also going to have to deal with with media massively. Um, but to me, it seems very exciting right now that there is this confederation of movements that I personally haven't really seen before. You know, the Enough is Enough joining up with XR um, and lots of other Don't Pay UK. The, you know, everybody seems to be coming together because of the cost of living crisis. And there's sort of this luck, I suppose, that the cost of living crisis is, is being driven by energy. And that is raising people's awareness of how um, bad a system the fossil fuel system is and how if you want to rely on something, why are you relying on it being imported from a different country when it's also highly destructive when we have, you know, onshore wind and we've got lots of other things at our disposal. Um, so there seems to be this very exciting uh, yes, uh, solidarity happening between these movements. How do you think that's going to impact the the coming year? And are you already seeing uh, it impact how people talk about, say, the the climate crisis? Like you, I, I also find this really, really exciting because um, you know it, it it it's logical. It's 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 the only way to go. I, yeah, I, I really like mm. the the gilet jaune slogan: um, end of the week, end of the world same crisis and it, it it really is you know you know almost every any social or, or environmental ill can be traced back to neoliberalism essentially mm. um and 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 it, it 
you know, so, so, so we have the same fundamental root cause of, of all our different social and, and, and uh, environmental crises. So obviously it makes sense to, to, um, to, to, to synergistically address that root cause. It's the, the difficulty is, is in communicating that because as you say, uh, the media and, and, and the capitalists have for a long time pitted, um, social against environmental yeah. red against green yeah. green is yeah. an enemy to 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 jobs and prosperity the the, the classic yeah. um example of this was um, a battle in in the pacific northwest of the usa between um conservation and an owl and, and logging jobs um mm. uh, I, I i think that the, the key thing for the movement is to um, to continue being a, to continue highlighting the links between them, um, and to continue pushing, as you say, for, for, for a movement of, of movements to, to bring all these movements together. Now we, um, yeah, most people in, in the climate movement are not just calling for an energy transition. We're calling for a just transition. Mm. to ensure that that the energy transition doesn't negatively impact people working in certain industries so that includes you know government should be offering retraining opportunities for example for those engineers that work in the fossil fuel sector to retrain to work in 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 the renewable sector we i, I think social justice is absolutely at the heart of of climate activism and must mm. remain at the heart of climate activism. And I think one of the big communications challenges for, for, for climate activists is to, I, I don't know, to show people how all these problems are connected and, and, and how um, uh, an energy transition should be um, Liberatory, it should be, you know, it, 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 if done in yeah. a certain way, it, it can have massive positive uh, social impacts. It's not just a case of avoiding negative social impacts. You know, we can have better, more pro social, more pro poor energy systems where, where we're not dependent on, um, you know, the profiteering of massive energy companies as, as we've seen recently. Things, as mm. you say, the difficulty is that. Climate, the climate movement doesn't really get to communicate directly to the public. Um, there is a gatekeeper in between, and that's the mass media. And 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 yeah. and they, you know, they frame certain things in 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 certain ways. And you know, for a long time, they have they have very very deliberately framed environmentalism as a threat to working class people as a. Yeah. a you know, this is a, a, a classic divide and conquer strategy, and it, it's been very yeah. deliberate. And you know, they will con that that strategy continues now. One of the great, one of the most common discourses of delay that we hear when we talk about um, the need to rapidly decarbonize, the you know, right wing media commentators say, um, "You can't do that because it it might affect poor people. It might." hit the energy bills of poor people. But yeah, this is literally the only time these right wing commentators have yeah, ever yeah, expressed yeah, yeah, yeah. any concern <laughs> for poor people at yeah. all. And yet they yeah. would stick with that line. So so yeah, the big challenge is not uh yeah yeah the big challenge is, is a communications one because b b b because the media will, will always try and frame it in a certain way. And I don't really know what, um, how to overcome that really, other than to, to, to remind everyone and to urge your, your listeners to, to communicate ourselves. You know, um, word of mouth, face-to-face -face communication is so much more powerful than, than um, the media. And, and it's, it's the only way to, to overcome it. Now, you know, remember that, you know, it's very easy for us in our bubbles, in, in our um, environment bubbles, to, to think that, that other people uh, are hearing our messages. But 
for most people, the, you know, the, what they hear is, is the mainstream media and they, they, they get presented with certain discourses. So it's up to all of us as individuals to, um, to take every opportunity we can to, you know, to talk to people and, and, and to, to discredit these, these, these popular discourses because, because we're not going to win the mass media round. I don't, I don't think, you know, they represent certain class interests. Um, they are, they, they represent the in interests of their advertisers. They represent the interests of, of economic growth. Um, and in many cases, they, you know, because of their billionaire proprietors, they, they have, they have a certain editorial line, you know, um, Murdoch media have a, um, a have for a long time adopted a denialist position on climate change and, and whilst not all their, um, their, their stations and papers are denialist now, they, they certainly still fail to adequately, um, communicate what's, what's, what's going on. And they do, um, also perpetuate these, you, you know, climate versus jobs discourses and things. So, so I think we need to. We need, we need to bypass the media by, 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 by yeah, speaking to the people we know and love and, and, and persuading them of what's right. Yeah. And, and, and it, it's, it's incredibly important that we, you yeah, know, it's difficult. It's, it, it, it pushes us out of our comfort zones. Nobody wants to have difficult conversations with people and, and, you know, potentially conflicting conversations that might lead to, 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 to disagreements or, or disappointing people or making people feel judged or whatever, but, but you yeah, really, there's, there's no more powerful way to communicate than one-on-one -on -one with, with people we know and love. And I, I think it's, it's something we need to do more. We need to push ourselves beyond our comfort zones and, and, um, yeah, talk. Yeah, it's, it is so important. Um, I think it is incredibly frustrating to see people avoid, you know, debate around a dinner table for fear of upsetting somebody uh, in a time like this. However, I think also you cannot underestimate the power. There's a reason that the media has been invested in so much and why people want to have access to it, because it, it does control the messaging. And it, I think it does overpower a lot of the conversations that do happen one on one, because where are people getting their information from in order to have those debates? Uh, in order to engage in those conversations. Um, certainly, like, and obviously with my position, it's the thing that I'm most interested in, like media reform, obviously given my background. What, um, for like our, our penultimate question, what, what does Scientists for Rebellion or what does XR want? Like what is the goal uh, in the next five or 10 years before 2030? Um, yeah. I... I, I can't answer that um, as uh, uh, an official spokesperson for for either group. Yeah. Um, and for both groups, it's slightly different. Scientists Rebellion exists specifically to mobilise the scientific community. So, mm. what what Scientists Rebellion wants in the next five years is tens of thousands of scientists on the streets, actively resisting. Um, because we believe that scientists have a certain, uh, authority, certain cachet in society and that seeing thousands of scientists being arrested, making that sacrifice, stepping away from their careers to, 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 to potentially sacrifice their, their liberty, um, mm. is such a powerful act that it will that it obliges people to think, to, to really think about why people would do that. Um, extinction rebellion, I... Sorry, no, but hang on, let's, let's stay on that. Like, but after, after the resisting, we're resisting, but then the idea would be to Im implement what? Like we've citizens assembly and what else? So, um, like, like I said, uh, XR doesn't specifically set, um, Policies. set, set policy yeah. proposals. Yeah. Scientists rebellion. We, um, yeah, we advocate for a degrowth economy and, mm -hmm. um, and citizens assemblies. So, so, so we like, like XR, so XR have top level targets, right? 
zero carbon, zero destruction of nature. And we get there through citizens assemblies, which will decide on the policies to implement for how we get there. Okay. The scientists rebellion, we don't have explicit, we don't have our explicit three aims like that, but both organizations essentially, um, the theory of change for both organizations is based on, on the idea of social tipping points. Um, mm. we believe that the, the only power that we have that is sufficient to overcome the entrenched um, financial and political power of, 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 of existing special interests like you know, neoliberal fundamentalists that are opposed to any sort of government intervention and fossil fuel industries, aviation mm. industry, automobile industry, all of these, the only power we have to overcome their formal power is people power. So we are, are, are working towards achieving such a critical mass of people, of ordinary citizens in the streets taking action that we either um, force our, our, our leaders to take uh, the required action or, or we replace them with, with those that will. But I think you're, 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 you're right. It, yeah, I, I suppose some some people could could possibly see this as, as as a weakness in 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 the in the policy in that we are so so we've ex I I don't actually see it as a weakness, but extinction rebellions um, demands are in a way they're sort of negative demands, not positive demands. We're saying what has to stop. For, mm. you know, emissions and the destruction of nature have to stop. We're not mm. specifically saying what they need to be replaced with, but I think the, the, um, it's sort of implied is a sustainable economy. Um, mm. yeah, I, I don't think it's, uh, I wouldn't call it a weakness because I think that what is particularly interesting and exciting about change is that it is by taking that or implementing that very first change that other changes become available or become possible. Um, so by stopping fossil fuel, you know, I'm sure uh, the renewable economy that we could imagine after having stopped fossil fuels would be much more diverse and imaginative and real than the one that we would imagine now while still heavily using some fossil fuels. Um, perhaps just because of the urgency of the, <laughs> the matter when imagining that in the future. Um, but I think that it is something that uh, we hear from the public, even the public that are very, very supportive of climate action. They want to know what to do and they want to know what exactly they are fighting for and they want to know what the future will look like. Um, and they find it scary to campaign for a present to stop, even if that present will eventually stop one day, if they can't picture uh, what turn we will take in the future and what that will look like. Um, and I think that that is why some of the messaging around like, you know, a citizens assembly, like it, what could that look like? That's an amazing thing. You know, it is when you look more and more into the innovation of democracy and like what it could achieve in terms of like increasing people's well-being, increasing the diversity of decisions being made, um, having people just feel more involved and being able to take on more complex problems as a nation, as a society, it's really, really, really exciting. But that doesn't necessarily come through in the words of citizens' assembly yeah. because people don't know what it is. Um, and so I think there is a sort of um, need for the messaging of all groups um, and because I get tripped up on this when people sort of say to me, well, right, well, what should I do? It's like, oh, I, don't, I don't actually have a five-point list and I should be able to have a five-point list for people that are interested yeah. who are at the beginning and wouldn't know where else to turn. Absolutely. So uh, I'm working on, on, on that exact problem. I'm, I'm, I'm working on a book that oh, is excellent. an expansion of this five point list. So hopefully that'll be coming soon. You, you, you mentioned a lot of, of things there. I think, so I think the more I think about it, I think it is clever to not specify how we get there because, because I think that's where the division between people um, arises. So yeah, many right wing mm. people, for example, are uh, refuse to to take um climate change seriously because for them what they're scared of is that climate change is an excuse for government 
intervention uh, and they mm. are you know anti-government so yeah so it's not climate change that's the problem for them it's the it's the the their state. conception of what climate change means for politics. Mm. So when we start talking about how to get there, you're entering the realm of politics, and politics is divisive. If we just mm. focus on shared outcomes, a world we can all live in where people are prosperous, everyone can agree mm. on that. So you get people to agree on shared outcomes before the division, uh, before any divisiveness arises on how we get there. Just quickly on this issue of people not knowing what to do, I think you're absolutely right. And it is a real problem. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily Extinction Rebellion's um, role to, to be there providing the answer. So Extinction Rebellion mm. is the alarm, right? Our goal is to wake people up and get people concerned about this. But we're not the ones actually implementing the changes. Activists create demand for change. It's up to others to then step into the space that, ac that activism has created to, to supply um, this new demand with, with, with things to do. And I, th I think, so we talk a lot about how, how traditional campaigning, traditional environmental groups haven't been enough to shift the dial. Well, now activism has been enough to shift the dial. Lots more people are wanting to do something. I think we really need others, the more reasonable, more uh, acceptable voices than the, the Extinction Rebellion to come along and provide avenues for the newly concerned to, to get involved. Because you know, what we three years ago, nobody was talking about climate action at all. Now what you hear is they're absolutely right, but I don't like their tactics. So what are those people who 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 are have been you know woken up? What are they going to do? Because they're mm. not going to join mm. Extinction Rebellion because they don't like their tactics. They need some mm. someone else needs to come along and say we are the acceptable attractive voice um of, of, of climate activism come along and, and join us and what we see mm, is a lot of people flank. yeah yeah um except it doesn't need to be yes moderate flank exactly but it doesn't need to be created because it exists already and i, mm. I think the idea of the moderate flank is is really important but i think there are two things that i sometimes feel a bit uncomfortable with one is when people say don't do that do this you, you know um because it's not a question of either or. The answer is always both. And you, mm. know, you can't have a moderate flank without a radical flank. So, so, so yeah. yes, yeah. by all means, add the moderate flank to the radical flank. But the idea of replacing the radical flank with a moderate flank, I think, is, is a bit silly. Um, but also, yeah. I don't think the moderate flank needs to be created. It already exists. It's... Mm. it's Mm. It, it's conservation charities like like the NGO and, and the National Trust. It's Friends of the Earth. It's church groups and civil society organizations. It's it's scout groups. I don't know. There are all sorts of of of, of institutions and organizations working um, for change, and and mm. and they need to step up and and and, and say, yep, yeah, right, you're concerned now. We will help you turn your concern into action. Mm, very good point. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially for for people that fall into that bracket of, yes, I, am, I, I agree with XR, but I don't like their messaging. I think they should do something else. Well, what do you want to do then? Exactly. What would make you happy to do? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This is really yeah. important. I, I think, yeah, it's very easy for people to just sit at home and criticize, but I would urge you, please, if you have ideas, if, if, if you, know, you sit at home thinking about what would be effective, but all that effort, all that thinking is wasted if you just tweet about it. Join a group, doesn't have to be Extinction Rebellion, but which whatever group you're comfortable supporting, join a group and get those mm. ideas implemented. Extinction Rebellion is not made up of leaders. It's made up of people like you that come to meetings with their ideas and persuade the group members to implement their ideas. So please, just doesn't matter what label you give yourself, what group you join, just get up off your arse and do something. <laughs> this is an emergency, please. 
What a fantastically powerful note to end on, Charlie. Thank you very much. My final question for you is who would you like to platform? I would like, rather than one particular, rather than give you a name, I, I, I would like to platform indigenous um, defenders of, of, of the earth um, from, from, from the global south. There was a report from Global Witness who published just a couple of months ago. Um, I, I forget the precise figure, but it was 1,700 Earth, you know, indigenous earth defenders were, have, have been killed around the world in, in the last few years. No. The talk on you know, all discourse on climate is far, far, far too focused on, 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 on people from our societies, people like, like me. Um, and you know, in, in, in a way, it's no surprise that the discourse is centered on our industrial societies. We are the ones that are most responsible. We are the ones that, that have yeah. to change. But yeah. because, because we're the ones in the limelight all the time, it's, it's easy to, to, be, to get the impression that it, it, it's not about us. But what we, have to, what we have to remember is that while we are responsible for the problem, we are not the first victims. We, um, mm -hmm. We, we we have wealth um, and we have social safety nets, which will protect us to some extent from the, um, from the impacts. People in the global South um, don't have those safety nets and they don't have, uh, um, you know, that, that, that financial buffer. Um, I think we need to listen to people on the front lines much, much more on top of, and it's not just that they're um, as, as, the vulnerable and the victims we need to be listening to them, but often they have lots of, of, of you know, knowledge that we also need to be listening to. Different viewpoints, different um, experiences, and then, as I mm -hmm. said before, with in the context of citizens' assemblies, the more we listen to different viewpoints, the better our decisions um, will be. Absolutely right. Thank you very much for that suggestion. I'll be sure to reach out for them, Charlie. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been such a pleasure, Rachel. Thank you. If you want to learn more about Scientist Rebellion, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon, where you can also read my weekly essays inspired by each podcast interview. The Patreon link is in the description box below. As always, thank you to the Planet Critical community who support the show and make all of this work possible. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.